Let's get down to the mastering process. In the view you see on the screen now, the stereo file on the bottom is the original source file with the corrected noise reduced elements. So I've taken the original file, and if you can see right here, I brought everything, the entire file, down 3 dB. The original full-scale digital value of the file was minus 0.3. So I needed some headroom, and that minus 0.3 occurred when it got really loud down here, okay? You can see right here, it's minus 0.3. So that didn't give me a whole lot of headroom to work. So I just, in uh, Pure Mix, which is what I'm using as my DAW, you can go in and select a file and simply type in the gain value that you want that file to be played back at. So, uh, because this file, this song did not need to be smashed uh, and made extremely loud, and I wanted to maintain some dynamic, so I only brought it down 3 dB because that's all the headroom I really felt I needed. So, let's look at simply this setup. The file up here is the final mastered product. Over here, it starts out very softly, and over here, yeah. It gets loud, and it looks like it's squared off. Yeah, well, let's just zoom in and see. No, no, it, no, actually the file is not squared off. It looks actually nice. But let's zoom out again, and I'm gonna pull the console up that I work with. Right here, I work from, and I know it doesn't make sense, but I work from right to left. I put the source file right here, and it's playing back to my second D to A, okay, so I, that I can always come over to my console and listen to the original file. My uh, mastering console is made by Crookwood. Um, it's a uh, monitor matrix that allows me to listen to um, any aspect of the file at any point in time. The first place it's gonna hit is FabFilter Pro Q3 which to me is a very um, effective equalizer that I use to um, uh, take care of some medicinal things. I high pass the original file in this one. I'm high passing at 27.7 uh, in the mid part of the signal, as opposed to the side, mid side technology. The thing about mid side is that it gives us uh, discrete access to everything that is in the center image discreetly as opposed to anything that's not in the center image. So the farther your pan pot leaves the center position, the more it becomes a member of the side. If your pan pot on a given mono signal is all the way to the left or right, it is 100% a member of the side element. So in mid-side processing, I can access those elements discreetly. And in mid-side EQ, I can EQ the mid completely separately from the side. So it gives us access to a lot of uh, uh, not only medicinal corrective measures, but it also gives me access to creative EQ also. Now in this instance, I'm high passing at 27 hertz because, uh, as a matter of fact, I'm going to put my cursor in a position where I can play the signal that has a lot of bass in it, uh, or some some bass in it rather, so I can show you what that does. Okay, we've got some nice bass going on here. So in the EQ, I can come here and I can listen right here to exactly everything that I'm removing. So see over in the right, I'm getting rid of some low frequency things that are below 27 hertz, and you see on the metering, it's peaking up at about minus 45, so it's not really being affected, but I'm getting rid of things that are not helpful, not needed in the end product. Same thing here. This is uh, some EQ that I decided I needed in this particular instance. So right here, I'm adding 1.38 dB at uh, 63 hertz with a Q of 1.2. You can actually see here. So. Um, 
I'm going to listen to that EQ only so I know exactly what I'm doing. And that's the area that I wanted to bring up. So, and that's the mid signal, the mid part of the stereo image right, right there. And I'm high passing the uh, side at uh, 53 hertz. And in the side, I'm also uh, doing a little trick, some th adding some thickness in the side at 125 hertz, half a dB, just a little bit to add a little thickness. So it's the EQ curve that I'm using initially. The next sort of medicinal and or creative thing I'm going to do, so by the way, this is um, Ozone. Uh, I believe this version is eight. And I'm going to work on the stereo imagery just a little bit. This is a little kiss of image spread between 200 and 3.39K. And all that's doing is adding just a little bit, I'm tickling the stereo image to widen it just a little bit in the mid to upper mid range area in this area. And it's just a little creative thing that I choose to do sometimes and it just is kind of nice and sweet. And it's gonna hit my compressor. Uh, I've got it set up mid side, right here, mid and side, multi band, but I'm only choosing to use three different bands. But again, it's three bands in the mid, and or three bands in the side. And in this instance, I'm compressing the bottom end ever so slightly, six to one ratio, attack time, 250 milliseconds, release 500. Let's see if we can see how much it's actually compressing at that point in time. And a curse. Could have used a cold shoulder. Not much. A pretentious he's my grin. Just to prove to me that you're no good. Now that's a solo of that band and exactly what it's doing. I got it turned down really low in the studio here. But I've got my attack time delayed by 250 milliseconds, so I'm not. I'm not being triggered by the kick. Of course, I can't separate the kick from the bass at this point. I might be being ugly to even tell you this. Didn't feel like I needed to do any compression in the mid. And here I'm working on sibilance. Now, again, this is the mid signal. And I'm working at uh, everything from 4K up. Now, I'm only, I'm not limiting, as you can tell here, I'm only compressing. But I'm at a 10 to one ratio. My attack time is at 250 milliseconds because I don't want to address the snare. I want to address simply the sibilance. And it's a very difficult thing to do. But I want the snare to pass through before any high frequency uh, reduction is done. It's sort of difficult to do and still address the sibilance that I think needs to be addressed ever so slightly. That's how I'm doing that. Now, I'm not gonna play that for you because it's uh, very irritating to listen to that mid, that just that signal alone. We can look and see what it's doing here. Thing and occurs. Could've used a cold shoulder A pretentious he's my grin Just to prove to me That you're no good for him I wish you weren't so pretty I wish you were so sweet I wish he didn't need you Like he doesn't need me I wish... So the original mix was in really good shape to begin with. And this is just protective, um, sort of calming down of some of the sibilance that occurred occasionally. Next, <laughs> this is a creative tool that you might uh, be interested in looking at. It's uh, called the Oxford 
and flare, of course, and it simply does what the name implies. It's a plugin that you just have to listen to and realize what it's doing. It literally does inflate the signal. You take it in and out and you listen to it and it's one of my Mo Beta plugs. <laughs> it's one that uh, you can use on a lot of different sources. Uh, we'll run the file with it in and then I'll take it out. I wish you weren't so pretty, I wish you were so sweet. I wish he didn't need you like he doesn't need me. I wish I hated you just like I wanted to. Oh, but you turned out to be so pretty. Sometimes you have to listen hard for the differences. And again, as I've mentioned many times before, you never want to ask one plug-in to do it all. And by the end of the, the stream, the cumulative effect at the end of the line is that you've asked each plugin to do what it does best, but you're not overtaxing it. You're just using a, a little bit of what it does. And by the time you get to the end, you're not overtaxing anything. And everything is working at peak performance. I find it to be a much better way to go about it. The next thing I hit was uh, the old Slate FG. This is a, a transient modulator, and uh, it's one of the most musical sounding transient devices I've uh, ever come across. And um, it just adds a little bit of spice or transient values to upper frequencies that I find very appealing in certain circumstances. I wish you weren't so pretty, I wish you were so sweet, I wish he didn't need you, like he doesn't need me, I wish I hated you, just like I wanted to, oh but you turned out to be so pretty. Again, perhaps you have to be on, uh, uh, you need to be on head, headphones to hear some of these differences. It's just little additive parts of what these plugins do best. To get even more subtle, some plugins, like this, this one, the Shadow Hills Mastering Compressor, this is an emulation of that old analog piece. And for my money, it's one of the more, um, for lack of a better word, accurate emulations. It's extremely subtle. I just simply like sometimes throwing the signal through it. It's got uh, uh, just a um, artistically, I think, valuable uh, footprint that it places onto the file. Now down here, you have three options. And these are the emulations of the three different transformers that are available in the original unit. Nickel, iron, and steel. And I think you can read in the manual, nickel is fairly transparent, but even in the nickel position, you'll hear a little, what I call candy. <laughs> when you listen to the difference between the signal going in and out, it's like, yeah, I like that. During the mastering of this project, I. I chose, I chose the uh, iron. And as you go down, when you choose the different transformers, it uh, interjects a little bit of saturation up on the top end, which acts as a sort of a uh, softening of the top end. And when you get down to steel, it's, uh, it, it's even, it saturates a bit more. So if you've got a harsh track to begin with, you can soften to a very, very small degree by choosing these different transformers. So uh, as long as we're in the input, we'll go ahead and let's first listen to it with it in, and then I'll take, I'll take it out. I wish you were so pretty, I wish you were so sweet. I wish you didn't need you like he doesn't need me. I wish I hated you just like I wanted to. 
the difference is extremely subtle, I understand, but that's what we deal in, subtleties. The next stage I go to and uh, have been enjoying quite a bit is the Abbey Road TG. It's an emulation of their uh, old uh, mastering console, um, and but the section of it that I like the most is its uh, limiter section. One of the interesting things I like about it is its side chain. It has three different adjustments in its side chain. The classic side chain is your high pass here, of course. Uh, you can set it to high pass uh, low frequencies out of the detection circuit or conversely up at the top. Well, one of the unique things about it is that it's got a section, a parametric section in, in the uh, middle. And you can set the frequency to whatever you want and you can add or subtract that frequency range from within the side chain so that your uh, limiter or compressor is set up not to re react. I haven't run across a uh, plug-in that has that within its side chain detection circuit yet. So I've, de I've decided in this track to uh, reduce uh, at three, a little above 3,000, 9 dB so that it's not being triggered by that frequency range. Therefore, the transients are gonna flow through a little bit more. And then I also use this particular plug for gain. Now, earlier I dropped my signal 3 dB to get some headroom for processing in those earlier plugs. Okay, now it's time to start bringing the signal back up. And in this instance, I brought it up 4 dB. And we'll get to the next one in just a second. But another aspect of this particular plug-in is the emulation of the stereo spread adjustment, they, they call it spreader there, in the old console. In uh, the original days of stereo enhancement, phase cancellation was used a lot to create false stereo imagery, and it was just this, not a good way to go about doing it. Um, but this particular spreader, you can check for phase continuity when you're adjusting spread and just listen for for phase, and uh, it's just the uh, stereo um, image enhancement of that particular adjustment is, um, I find very appealing. At this stage, I'm spreading the signal just a little bit, and I've added some gain. And a little bit of compression here, ratio 2.8. We'll play a little bit of it, and you can see what's going on down here. I wish you were so pretty, I wish you were so sweet. I wish he didn't need you. So I'm just barely kissing it, uh, but all along the line, I've just been doing little small things to get things into control. Now here is the next stage. This is the emulation of the API 2500. Now this unit does not have a digital readout of what you're doing, but after all, you're supposed to be using your ears. Anyway, um, I'm adding a little bit more gain here. I'm doing a little bit of compression. The threshold is set fairly low, or, or high rather. And um, attack time is not very fast. The ratio is 1.5 to one. So let's look and see what I'm, what I'm doing with it here. I wish you were so pretty, I wish you were so sweet. I wish you didn't need Okay, so you can hear I'm, I'm adding a, a, a bit of gain. We'll go back and I'll take the TG in and out for you as well. I wish you were so pretty, I wish you were so sweet. I wish he didn't need you like he doesn't need me. You can tell I'm, I'm adding gain here too. Now, I basically got the overall level I want, but I need to start protecting myself. So. Go back here and look at this fader right here, you'll start to see overs. I wish you were so pretty, I wish you were so sweet. I wish he didn't need you like he doesn't need 
Okay, that's going to be a problem. I'm not going to be able to issue the file at that stage. But because I'm uh, working at 32-bit float, um, I'm not going to distort internal aspects of the DAW. But that dynamic range doesn't exist in the real world. So I've got to now um, digitally control that output to the point where I can release it to the public. So one of the tools that I use here is in Ozone 8. It's the maximizer. This is a limiter and sort of creative tool Ozone's come up with um, that has a whole bunch of different modes that you can, you really need to read about. Um, but one of the most, uh, the one ones that, the one that I use quite often is the IRC3 in a balanced form. This is just me. I like the way it sounds, and I generally turn true peak protection on. I don't ask it to, I don't lower the threshold or the ceiling down. I'm already hitting it with a pretty hot signal to begin with, and I tell it to be respectful of my transients as much as I can ask any plugin to be, and I have to work with the character setting such that it doesn't distort. So let's put the signal into it right now. I wish you were so pretty, wish you were so So it's limiting. She didn't need you, like it doesn't need me. I can take it out. I wish I hated you, just like I wanted to. You're not going to hear a lot of difference, but internally, it's controlling my digital values internally, but they're not controlled completely yet. So the last stage that I hit is Fab Filters Pro L2. It's a straight up limiter. For my money, it is one of the more transparent limiters that has a number of adjustments here that you can change and so forth but I also make sure that my true peak limiter is on. So let's see what it's doing to the signal. I wish you were so pretty, wish you were so sweet. I wish he didn't need you, like he doesn't need me. I wish I hated you, just like I wanted to. Oh, but you so again, it's just calming the signal down just a little bit, making sure we have no true peak overs, and I'm not gonna run into trouble when I finally issue the product. Now, final product coming out of the fab filter is going to this fader, which I have turned down to minus 0.6. I have to issue a product in the digital world that will live through without any problems being converted to MP3, AAC and all the various different formats that it's going to be converted to in order to enter the public domain. The file that I'm creating right here is going to be uh, uh, 48K 32-bit. I can't release it in that format. For a CD release, it's got to be converted to 16-bit 44.1. And then from those formats, from 16-bit 44.1, it's going to be converted to MP3, AAC, all, and all the various formats. Well, you have to provide some headroom for those conversion processes. If I issued my final 16-bit 44.1 file with a, a full-scale digital value of zero, the uh, likelihood of me running into trouble down the road after it got converted to MP3 or whatever, I'd probably run the risk of it being distorted. So it's incumbent upon me to make sure that the headroom and my file, my final release file, is such that in the conversion process, the file does not become distorted. That's very important to me. Let's show you now the difference between the original file and the mastered file, okay? So I'm gonna put the original file back in full level. And we're gonna listen, I'm gonna go back and forth between the original file and the 
mastered file. Unfortunately, there's going to be a large difference in volume level. Uh, deal with it. Mastered file first. Spent two hours getting ready With my makeup in my hair My best friend Amy Pick out what to wear and there's a time difference because of the DSP, of course. I practiced what to do, just what to do. But it all went out the window when I met you. I wish you weren't so pretty. I wish you I wish he didn't need you like he doesn't need me. I wish I, I wish I hated you just like I It works. Yeah, this killing me with kindness. It's a blessing and a curse. I could have used a cold shoulder, a mind grin, just to prove to me that you're no good for him. I'm gonna switch to the mastered file and let it play from there. So hard, so pretty, wish you were so sweet. I wish you didn't. One of the reasons why I chose this track is, number one, it's uh, quite musical in its arrangement, but it's got dynamics, for crying out loud. It really represents what I think music is all about. So much of the time nowadays, producers and so forth think that everything's got to be just louder than hell. Well, that may be workable for a hard rock piece, but when it gets down to dynamics and uh, emotion. I think this is one of the better representations of what we should be doing and what we're doing wrong by uh, mastering things so loud that we lose all of this creativity, this emotion. The dynamic in this song, yeah, it's been changed from the, the original mix because I had to ma master it loud, but I didn't smash it and I didn't alter the original dynamic from the top top to bottom, because musically it made sense. It just feels good. It feels right, it's correct. It's the way music is supposed to be. I used to get frustrated with producers that, um, that uh, said, well, can't you get it just a little bit louder? And I said, yeah, we can do that. And I'd send them a, a, a louder version. And uh, I said, hmm, kind of lost some of its impact, hadn't it? some of its art. I said, yeah. So which way do you want to go? You want to go for the art or you want to go for logistics? Well, in some cases, you have to combine both. Take the logistics in the worst case scenarios in the car. If you're driving down road 70 miles an hour, you got a lot of road noise. You try to listen to classical music, you're going to miss a lot of it. So it's, in, it's part of my responsibility to make sure that, the, that the, the dynamics built into the piece and that I allow to pass here will work uh, logistically in a car. 
and there's got to be a happy medium. It's a compromise between dynamics and art. It's my job sometimes to decide how much art is supposed to be left in the original production. At least I feel like I know where the value can be and should be and try and I try to maintain as much dynamic as possible such that the art that was originally intended by the producers is still there. At any rate, I chose this piece because I think it meets both uh, requirements and it's just a well-performed good piece of uh, music and has a lot of value.